So this is Max Dixon reporting for InfoWars, and we are here with Max Kaiser of the Kaiser Report, and uh, we are here to talk with him about several questions that are going on in this crazy world that we live in today. Fantastic. Awesome. So Max, how are you doing today? Well, it's uh, it's a beautiful day here in Paris, Max, and um, you know we're watching very closely developments in Europe. Absolutely, absolutely. And in light of Europe, what are uh, some of the latest developments going on in Europe over the last month or so? And what would you say is the current state of the EU? Well, uh, you saw what happened in Greece. They uh, installed a technocrat in the government, the same thing in Italy. And the problem is that the credit crunch that started in 2008 in a big way is continuing to contract economies around the world. And the response from the central bankers has been to print money, but that money is getting stuck in the investing banks, the commercial banks. It's not being re-loaned out. So the, the net result of all of this is uh, contraction and economic activity. And um, the, the governments are reacting with uh, programs of austerity. And uh, it's resulting in a real... Uh, hardship. So in Greece recently, in Athens, uh, we had a pensioner shoot himself in the head, killed himself in the most public square. That happened about a week ago, right? That's right. And this is the, the, the anxiety sweeping Europe. And of course, Spain now, it's a $2 trillion economy, and it looks like that'll be the next to go the way of Greece. These austerity measures kicking in and, and extreme hardship. The unemployment is already extreme, and so the, the economy is very fragile. Awesome, awesome. And uh, regarding uh, the technocrats being installed in Europe, uh, would you uh, just describe that process for our leaders? Are these uh, people elected into office? Are they? Uh, how how do these people attain these positions? Well, under the uh, the guise of a necessity of the crisis, if there's a crisis, so to react to the crisis, they bring in these outsider technocrats. Which and who are brings them in? The global institutions okay. like the IMF, the World Bank, uh, and not the people. No, no, because everything is being managed from the top down. So that's part of this new, this new uh, configuration of the global economy is that the democratic forces that come from the ground up are being squashed by these, by these imperial dictates that are being forced from on top. So you have these, these folks being brought in because of the crisis. But the crisis, of course, was created in large part by the very same bankers and technocrats with policies that have uh, replaced real economic activity with the activity of banking, uh, and which has become the creation and trading of derivatives, just uh, abstractions on, on a real economy, which has forced uh, the economic activities of manufacturing and other types of activities that provide real capital and savings out of the picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, it makes the economies very unstable. They crash because of it, and then the very same people who created the crash have the solutions to the crash, which is, well, let's put in a dictator, essentially, to dictate policies that we are bringing in from outside, and uh, to pay for all the problems that we created, we're going to impose these austerity measures. Of course, of course, and I, I imagine that the people aren't very happy with the fact that they don't really have dem democratically elected governments in place, and as we can see, there's all these riots and general strikes that are going on in Greece, Spain, and... Uh, and Italy and all this kind of stuff. And so I was wondering, do you see, have you noticed any sort of coherent political movement that's really aware of what's going on, that's really focused kind of similar to like the United States Ron Paul movement or the UK Independence Party? Do you see anything like that forming up, or is there just kind of this general unhappiness and displeasure at uh, the austerity packages that are going on? Well, the reaction is on both sides of the political spectrum, so the far left and the far right in France, we have an election coming up. The socialist candidate is leading the, the current Sarkozy, who is right of center. But they also have very strong representation with the Communist Party. And communists uh, around Europe are getting a lot of strength. But so are the far right, mm -hmm. the, the neo-Nazi part, if you will. It's also <laughs> gaining strength. But it's also gaining strength in the United States. So the political extremism on either side is uh, coming out in force. Uh, the center ground is being lost, and there's nobody defending the center because it, that would mean that there would have to be an honest accounting of what has happened in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. and there would have to be an honest accounting of what these banks really hold on their balance sheets, and there would have to be an honest and severe uh, 
penalty imposed on banks that were involved in this uh, misappropriation of capital and wealth. Mm -hmm. And since they are also the judge and jury uh, in this system, they're, they're, none of that is going to happen. So political extremism is going to continue to rise, and the situation and the markets are continuing to become unstable, increasingly more unstable. So uh, this looks like uh, we're on course to more of the same, but worse. Right, of course. And about the markets, that's the next topic I wanted to talk about. Uh, Greece has essentially already defaulted. Bondholders have lost over 60% of their value in their bonds, and their maturities are being delayed, and e even though the yields are fairly high. Um, but so, what would you say would be a good timeline for predicting at this credit crunch continuing to countries like Greece, uh, not Greece, Spain, Italy, uh, in terms of uh, bondholder haircuts, uh, postponing of maturities? What would you say is a good timeline to expect something like that in Spain or Italy, for example? We just have to look at the the timeline of when the bonds are due for the next refinancing. Uh, and Spain and Italy both have huge multi-billion euro tranche of debt that needs to be rolled over in the next six to twelve months. So it doesn't look like they're going to be able to meet those obligations. Mm -hmm. Greece is actually in line to get a third bailout because the economy is contracting a lot more than even the worst case scenario. So that's still a, a terrific problem. More austerity measures, even more severe austerity measures mm -hmm. in Greece, auster severe austerity measures in Spain. Spain is a big economy, big country. It'll be interesting to see whether the riots will be able to be contained as they were in, in Greece, if they can contain them in Spain, it, it, it seems like that would be a lot harder to do. Right. And which bond, uh, which bonds are you referring to? The one year, three year, five year? Well, th the whole complex of, of maturities across the board. Okay. You know, they're, they're all in various uh, maturities that need to be rolled over. I know that in Spain, there's a multi hundred billion euro package that needs to be rolled over in the mm -hmm. near term. Same thing with Italy. Um, so it, it, the bonds payments don't go away. Uh, the solution, for, for example, in Greece is at, at the end of this process that they just concluded, the second bailout, the net indebtedness of the country it was increased by something like 30 billion euros. Yes. So the solution, once again, was to ex extend the maturities, try to keep interest rates artificially low, and to increase the amount of debt. So they didn't reduce the debt. Right. They increase the debt. Of course. Of course. And do. this is the same thing across the globe, is that the debts are increased as part of the solution to roll over the debt. And the theory being that, well, someday economic growth will kick in and the debts will be paid off with the growth. But it's, it's mathematically impossible for any scenario you could concoct to generate enough growth to generate enough revenue to pay off these debts, especially when you see things like unemployment rates skyrocketing all over the world. Right, absolutely. Like, I, For example, I just read uh, from the Economic Times, an article that came out a week ago, that said that this bailout package for Greece and their austerity cuts is only designed to get their GDP their uh, GDP to debt ratio from 160% down to possibly 120% by 2020. So it doesn't right. really seem very realistic. Right, course. but even that's a very rosy scenario. It assumes a lot of growth that you can't see where that's coming from. Right, absolutely. Now, I just want to quickly shift to uh, the silver market. Uh, and one thing I was talking about is uh, thinking about recently is the manipulation that's going on and some sketchy kind of sell-offs that going on. One example is an, an incident I think will probably go down in history in some day when uh, Ron Paul decided to flash his silver eagle in front of Ben Bernanke when he was uh, employing him to let gold and silver be a parallel currency that doesn't have capital gains taxes as in other countries and so promptly after that within the first 10 minutes there was a massive sell-off silver had broken through a huge 36 dollar resistance and then sold off about either three and a half or four dollars i don't quite remember but what what exactly was going on there what is your opinion <laughs> on what happened there well a lot, a lot of people wrote about you know it was like holding up the silver bullet to the vampire <laughs> when, when ron paul made that move and um look the silver market you have to understand you can look at it in the following way the amount of money it takes to create an uptick versus a downtick is vastly lopsided. So the amount of money it takes, the exact numbers I don't have in front of me, but I, I noticed the ratio was about 5 to 1. So roughly it took $10 million of, uh, of transactions on the sell side to create a downtick, create a you know, mm -hmm. uh, negative print on the tape, and it took five times that amount to get an uptick. I see. And this has consistent, been consistent for years. 
Now this shows that the market's not clearing at a price where you'd have equilibrium. That's the great thing about markets, supposedly, if they're allowed to trade freely, is that they achieve a state of equilibrium where the buyers and the sellers are equally represented, and the result is that the invisible hand, as mm -hmm. Adam Smith calls it, and you have a mutually beneficial interest rippling through or distributed through the economy. But if you have a market like silver, where the buy-sell ratio required to create an uptick versus a downtick is for years lopsided, mm -hmm. Horribly, five, six, ten to one. And what it, what would you say explains that? Is it the existence of the mass naked short volumes that causes this this imbalance between the up and the down tech? Would you say it, it's abuse in the following way? There is a, a natural proclivity by people who are fearful of what's going on to buy gold and silver. So there's a natural pool of buyers. Gold and silver have an upward bias. We know this because the, over time the prices drifted upwards. Mm -hmm. The demand is very uh, substantial. And what, what, what has happened is that the central banks, the primary dealers, the investment banks, basically what they do is they wait for a sufficient amount of buyers to come in, jack the price up, and then they scalp the market with their naked shorts, mm -hmm. their shorting, and they can scalp three or four bucks on silver market easily. Uh, and, they, and they use it as a source of funds. And they use that source of funds then to go and promote their other interests. Uh, in, it could be manipulating the S&P futures mm -hmm. contract or manipulating some other index like the, the um, collateralized debt obligations. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, collateralized debt obligation market in the UK, it was just discovered that J.P. Morgan has a player there that nicknamed the whale mm -hmm. who is taking a proprietary position that's substantially bigger than the entire market to manipulate the index and to manipulate prices. This is on the very same day that Blythe Masters said in a CNBC uh, TV interview that J.P. Morgan is not in the business of manipulating markets. It's not They're just market makers or they're just there to help clients. At the very same day, we've discovered that they're, where she works in London, one of their other businesses, they now was revealed that they're manipulating it in, in an unbelievably obvious and harmful way. So she is just lying through her teeth. Right, of course, and uh, as a top, there's a recent article that just came out from the South Carolina Treasury's office that basically directly accused J.P. Morgan, New York Fed, and HSBC of artificially suppressing the price of silver, uh, contrary to those statements. So there's officials, even in local governments, who are starting to disagree and challenge them. But uh, as a 9-11 victim, I feel like a lot of, of uh, my subscribers and people on InfoWars want to hear us talk about 9-11. And so I would like to ask you, what is your opinion on 9-11? <laughs> well, there's three uh, things to consider on 9-11. One, was there inside information before the event? Two, did the people with that inside information participate in the event? And three, were they doing so on behalf of some foreign interest or governmental interest? On the first one, the answer is unequivocally yes. Mm -hmm. that people had inside information before the event. We see this telegraphed to us in the options market and the players involved. Buzzy Krongard, who was at Alex Brown, who then went to work with George Tennant, the CIA, the direct pipeline between the CIA, Alex Brown, where we know that $5 million of the profits from airline put trading was never collected. Mm -hmm. My theory is that it was a Morgan Stanley broker in the South Tower who died in the events who could have lived had he escaped, but decided oh, to stay my. and trade those options. That's very interesting. And and died. And we're, we're working on a uh, film about that called Broker Zero. Oh, wow. I'm, that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, now, the other two scenarios, did the people who were trading on this information, were they helping to organize and plan the, uh, the information, the, the event? I don't see any evidence to suggest that. I, I have no proof to, to, to say that that's, that's so. Similarly, I have no evidence to suggest that they were any connection to a foreign government that was working in cahoots with these guys mm -hmm. to do it. I don't have any, any proof of that, uh, of, those, of those parts of the story. But I do know, unequivocally, I can stay with assurance because I talked to actually people in the, the, the uh, Twin Towers because Canna Fitzgerald who lost 600 people that day, they had purchased my company just months before the event. Hmm. So I was in touch with those people. And I had also worked at Alex Brown as a stockbroker in the late 80s, early in the late, uh, yeah, late 80s. And I knew Brozzy Krongar. I met him a few times. Oh. So I, I'm actually, I, I know all the three sides of the triangle I see, I see. here. I know Alex Brown. I knew Kenneth Fitzgerald. I knew the buzz on these airline puts because 
the conversation at that time was this is like the Morton Thaikal situation before the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up. Mm -hmm. You know, when the Space Shuttle Chal Challenger blew up, the uh, the options on Morton Thaikal, which was the solid fuel booster rocket company, were there was about a 10 second <coughs> lag time where you could have bought those puts and made a killing. And I was one of these people. I was working at Oppenheimer at the time, and you know, I was talking to people about these options trading as if something had blown up. Mm -hmm. And then people are like, yeah, but nothing has blown up. What's, and then they're rumored. Well, there's, right. there's a rumor that something is going to blow up. And then you trace oh that rumor. And you say, oh, well, it's coming out of Alex Brown, my wow. employer. So I'm like, hey, have you heard this rumor? And like, yeah, there's a rumor. Wow. Something's about to blow up. And then you hear Buzzy Krongard's name. Where is Buzzy? Oh, he's over at the CIA now. Huh. Oh, okay, well, um, w you know, where are, the, where are these located, these rumors? In New York. Then you talk to the people at Cantor Fitzgerald, who I just bought my company, huh? right. Hollywood Stock Exchange. And they're like, well, you know, of course, uh, rumors are floating around, etc. And I was in Italy at the time, and uh, the day after 9-11, I was actually in the Vatican Square, and I heard the Pope give a, uh, a prayer meeting. Uh, very rarely, he also did a piece of it in um, English. <laughs> and uh, his, his comments were so benign and so anodyne and so useless that I actually got up and left in the middle. I remember people were like, who's this guy leaving in the middle of the Pope's speech? But um, you could not write heckle the Pope as such <laughs> with all those Swiss guards around. Right. But I did protest by just walking out on him. I felt that his, his comments were shamefully uh, ill-prepared and nonsensical and uh, meaningless. Kind of like the U.S. walking out on uh, Ahmadinejad when he uh, demanded Israel leave uh, Palestinian lands. I walked example. out. I walked out on the Pope. <laughs> that's very cool. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, just, it's, it's interesting that I didn't realize that you were so close to Cantor Fitzgerald. Uh, actually, uh, my uncle was a partner at Cantor Fitzgerald, and he died on that day. And if had he lived, I could have probably asked him about this. But unfortunately, that had it, that, uh, had it happened. Uh, I guess just very last qu question. Uh, did you ever happen to encounter my uncle? His name was uh, Peter Rodney Kellerman. He was a partner at Cantor Fitzgerald. He worked on the 110th floor. Do you happen to know him by any chance? No. But that's where they moved the, the uh, Hollywood Stock Exchange. They had bought it, and they moved it to that floor. Oh, wow. Oh, that's very interesting. They bought it, and they moved it. My company, Hollywood Stock Exchange, they moved it to the 110th floor. So I had some of my employees were working up there. I had, I had left. I was, I was living in Europe by that, by that time. And um, there's actually a lot of uh, contention between myself and Cantor and my, my board of directors, my previous board of directors, relating to that sale. Uh, but um, nevertheless, I was in touch with those folks, and uh, um, I think the most interesting aspect to it was the possibility of a broker trading on the puts. I think it's a Morgan Stanley broker. Mm -hmm. uh, he could have escaped, but it's the old question, your money or your life. He took, right. he took the he money. Took the money. <laughs> so that $5 million could be his. He could be yeah. an extremely rich guy, but unfortunately, he didn't live to enjoy it. Yeah. It is a shame, I suppose. <laughs> he died uh, happy, though. I guess, I guess he so. He died in the death of a stockbroker. He won. He died with, with his phone on. He died talking into the phone. You know, that's the way stockbrokers <laughs> want to go out. Placing an order. Buy me all those options. Crash. Boom. I'm dead. I won. Yeah, my father's a hedge fund manager. I, I certainly think he could feel that statement. That, that's well, I worked on the street for many years, so I think that's the way most brokers would like to go. Yeah, I, I, I could agree. I could agree. It seems like a good way to go out, I must say. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this is uh, the end of our interview with Max Kaiser. Thank you, Max, very much for inviting me. My pleasure, Max. This interview. <laughs> Great seeing you. All right. All right. So that's that. All right. Let's just check to see that everything works.